Do you have jammies on? It's a sweater. It's chilly in my house. I have a sweater too. I it, see that. It's sweater day. It is sweater day. We had what well, this is March. March. Yes, March in Portland. Yes. So March is the time when we does that cup say to cool mom? It, it does, does say cool mom. Cool mom. That is so cool. Because it's um, International Women's Day today and Wow. One of the coolest things I've done as a woman is be a mom. So be a mom, be a doc, be a therapist, be a really, yes, all of those things all at once. I love the picture of your family with you after you cross the 15 mile. 13 mile. Let's 13 not mile. It's half a marathon. That's half a marathon. Yes, I run half a marathon. I'm not entirely sure I could walk that far at this point. But I get a pass because I'm 76. I'm using that. You use that. Yes. Yeah. I'm 45. So all I. All um, about that. Yeah. I forget where we started. Sweaters. Where I got distracted with cool mom. Oh, sweater day. March in Portland is the month where you can get three seasons in one day. So we started out this morning with snow, big, wet fluffy flakes it was like snow globe snow in the backyard doesn't stick and then it rains for a little bit and then it's summer the sun's out blue sky 20 minutes later it's black sky and hail and then 30 minutes after that, it's sun again. Four seasons in one day is Portland in March. It's hilarious. So it's a sweater day. Right. It sounds like you have to dress in layers just to... This morning, I had a short sleeve t-shirt on that had the element of surprise. You remember that? Yes. And then I had to put a sweatshirt on. And then when I got dressed up to come do this, I put on a sweater. But yours looks like a cool, cushy bathrobe. It's like a cardigan type, wrappy type. Rappy. Yeah, it's very, it's not functional. Like you can't do anything in it than sit. So it's perfect for podcasting. It is. True it get very cold sitting here. Typically I have slippers on. Sometimes I have an electric blanket on me because I move around a lot. And if I sit still, I get cold. Yeah. I have more padding than you, truth to be told. So I don't have quite that problem. <laughs> wow. But I do have to say thank you to everybody who reached out to wish me good luck on the race. I was talking about it in Arizona and I, a lot of people are like, I'm going to send you good energy. And I really felt energized. I did do a PR is the fastest I've, I knocked off five minutes off of what I was hoping to get. So that was a, wow. That was a big deal for me. I was 15th in my age group out of 105 women in my wow. age group. So That's top 15 great. is pretty good. Yeah. Uh, I ran a lot of FSM the night before. So I yeah. will give credit where credit is due. My favorite is the, what do I call it? It's like a combo of recovery and concussion. And I, I married the two together. So there's some like neuro component and recovery component and Vitality. Muscle component and sarcomeres and all and, that good stuff. And all the good stuff. Yeah. So yeah. So that was great. It was neat to be the patient treating myself because I think as practitioners and practitioners with multiple hats, right? A lot of us are parents. A lot of us own our own clinics. So we're business owners. We're doing all the things. And it was funny. I did a Zoom call with Dr. Sosnowski yesterday as her patient. And she was asking me if I was running FSM on myself and we both kind of started laughing and it was like, like every night who has time, but I make time for myself when I'm training. So it's interesting how I found I was giving the excuses as a patient that I listened Ooh. to so busted. Oh, so it's like, I don't know how I would do life without FSM. So I, I keep my custom care and my converter in the nightstand because who has time in the daytime so I climb into bed and before I put my CPAP on but as I'm winding down I run insulin and leptin resistance and I've stacked 
insulin and leptin concussion and vagus. So I get vagus twice because it's in the leptin resistance protocol. And then I do concussion in vagus. And because I have to have a mammogram sometime soon, I've been doing breast health. And every now and then I do heart health. But it's like insulin, that beginning part at the advanced, when we when I put in those slides about how do you prevent dementia, the number one cause of dementia is inflammation. The number one cause of inflammation is insulin resistance. And the number one cause of insulin resistance is leptin resistance. So how do you prevent dementia? It doesn't make any sense to treat the brain. You start treating yourself 10 to 20 years before you anticipate possibly getting dementia by treating insulin and leptin resistance. Right. And just throw in 40 and 116 for general yeah. purposes. And I, think, I think we neglect all the, there's a saying about never mind pulling the people out of the river go upstream to see why they're getting in the river in the first place. Exactly. Yes. True. And I think as busy practitioners, we always wait till there's people floating in the river, like that we're trying to pull out. We're trying to put instead of preventative care, I guess is what I'm. They thinking. never come to us. They never come to us until they're in the river. Exactly. And the trick as practitioners is assuming you want to still be healthy and in practice when you're 76 yeah then you treat yourself upstream yeah because you can and, and it's amazing being practitioners in our world because we have tools to integrate into our well-being before there's an emergency or before there's an injury or before there's an illness and this is why I love talking to Jen Sosnowski and talking to her live when you can't slow her down or replay it back. Like I was sitting there with my pen and just trying to gather everything, her whole approach. And so many of the practitioners that are, especially at the advanced that you had lecture, just the mountains and mountains of information, but the big take home, the big idea from almost all of their lectures were get it before it gets bad. There's so many tools that we have and FSM doesn't do everything. And you and I both know that, but there's so many things we can do before an injury happens and, or before an illness like takes flight. Just because you have a family history of something, or just because you have an autoimmune condition, doesn't mean it's going to turn into anything. The key is to remember that genes are expressed in an epigenetic environment. We have genes for all sorts of things that simply never turn on. And I had an email from a patient with a familiar, what did he call it? Genetic. It was like a family history of AD and it's, what is AD? Oh, Alzheimer's disease. Mm -hmm. And it's just because your parents got Alzheimer's. If you look up your genetics and see where the SNPs are, you patch those holes to keep the genes turned off and do what you can to prevent it. It's right easy. It's just not that hard. I always feel so strange when I say that it's, it's just not that hard. And then it's there. Yeah. It's so funny. I was, I was outside at the advance talking to Wendy and Danielle, cause I have to jump out all the time and grab chocolate and check in on them and just hug them and then go back in again. And the new cover of the biology of belief was, and I have walked by that book for years and years and years. And it came up on my audible as my like book that I had to listen to on the way to the advanced. It was really oh, oh my. Wow. And then I was texting my husband. I was like, don't we have this audible account? I can't get into it. And I couldn't get into it. And I 
was irritated. So I grabbed the book when I was there because clearly the universe needed me to read it. Read, and I know I read it many moons ago, but it's like a new anniversary edition. There's new stuff in it. Yeah. And it says, I love the way it's written. Read it in two days because I didn't yes. have kids or meals or anything to do at the hotel. Thanks, it is. And he says exactly that just because you have these genes, and this is written by a cellular microbiologist, right? That's who he right. is, who took a very different turn during his research, which is fascinating. And it explains quite a bit. And I know why you have it at the advanced, because it explains a lot of what we do at a cellular level. Exactly. Yes. Bruce Lipton is amazing, Maddie. Yep. So I'm going to recommend this book anyways, to a lot of people who think that they have this life sentence because of a family history or because of an autoimmune flag or something, we have tools and our cells will listen to us. Mm -hmm. Give them the right. Cells listen to you all the time. What is fascinating to me and I don't know if I got it from Lipton or Bland or whoever but there are receptors for every single neurotransmitter on every single white blood cell immune system cell so happy thoughts good neurotransmitters good immune system there's receptors for every single neurotransmitter in every single cell in your small intestine. Happy thoughts, right? So after all of the stress of last year, I, it really helps that we are medical professionals because we have access to data that the average patient or citizen doesn't have. Yeah. So I see part of our role as practitioners, not just to treat with FSM, but to educate. Yeah. So the data says that when you have losses and stress, as I had last year, then within three years, you get some sort of serious illness. It's yeah, no. So I have two vacation scheduled this year. I haven't had a non-work vacation since 1992, just so everybody knows. Like, where do you go on vacation? I stay home because I travel for a living. And it's, no, I'm going to Wallawa Lake with my dog. I'm going to Glacier National Park because one of my patients said it was a cool place. And then we have three weeks in Hawaii this year. One week of core, which is like work unless it's done in Hawaii, at which point it's all different. And then two weeks of a master class. You look at the master class schedule and it's 9 a.m. to 1 p.m. I don't have to prepare anything because it's all in slides yeah. and it's completely individualized to who attends. And we're done at 1, 1 1.30, at which point. I get in the car and we are 15 minutes from the best snorkeling in Hawaii in the islands. So I have at least three, four weeks of vacation. And that's to give my epigenetics a way of recovering. And then you run concussion in Vegas and insulin and leptin. And then throw in a bunch of 970s just because you can. And so there's this three-hour program that runs between 10 o'clock at night and 2 o'clock in the morning. Because I can. Because you can't. Exactly. Yeah. So it's pretty fun. We have a lot to get to today. Okay. I'll let you drive the bus. Okay. We have some questions that came in already. I had one that was emailed that I promised we would get to. And I know we've discussed it before, but let's get to, I think Kevin put it on the chat for us. Debbie Benden is wondering if you can explain how the waveforms work with FSM. So the devices, all of them have square waves. So a sine wave is an exact frequency. 
It actually has no fuzz in it. It is 35.0000. That is a sine wave. All of the microcurrent devices that do FSM have square waves. And square waves have a lot of high frequency harmonics. And I'm not entirely sure what that is, but it's a word that the people that know what they're doing use. So I'm using that word. And it makes the wave a square. So it's actually pulses per second. Now, when it's when the leading edge of the wave is a square, straight up, straight over, straight down, that is sharp. When the leading edge of the wave kind of tapers a little bit before it gets to maximum, whatever that is, that's a medium wave. And a gentle wave slope is where the front edge of the wave is even more sloped. We use medium for virtually everything, unless you're trying to bust up old, crunchy, gnarly, resistant, don't start with me, yes. scar tissue. Yes. That I use sharp. Everything else, I just set it at five at medium and leave it there. What I found out as a patient is if you run even medium on a brand new injury, like post-operative or after you cut yourself or something, it's it buzzes. You can feel it in the wound. So that's when we use gentle. Yeah. So Debbie, in in general, set it on medium and leave it on till you get really annoyed at resistant tissue and decide to bust it up. Yeah. Yeah. It's funny. I came across that the hard way when I had a hangnail one day treating a patient and it was like an open wound right on my thumb. Yeah. And I had grabbed a towel or wet cloth that yeah. I was treating on a sharp because it was the old gnarly, crunchy, gross stuff. And I almost like, and the patient was like, what? And I'm like, oh, it's just because it just hit this like open wound that I had. And I grabbed another Band-Aid and I was fine. But it was like the first time I had really felt that. Yeah. Um, yeah. And to just go on with that, the way I explain it in the sports course is, especially for a new injury, the whole love affair that I have with FSM is that it's the sneaky like I'll say like stealth bomber, right? It goes in, it comes out. We don't know that it's there. It's beautiful for athletes because, and especially for professional hockey players that are playing four times a week, sometimes their schedule is insane. So they don't have that day to feel like they've been hit by a Mack truck the way I used to practice, right? Like to bust up scar tissue, to get at anything deep, regardless if it was acute or chronic, you're going in with your elbow, you're like, you're doing the thing. And as good as you think you are, you're still making collateral damage. I always have that in my head. Like, how can I sneak the current in there unnoticeable so nothing splints and nothing tightens up and nothing has an opinion? And so I, I normally will have things at a gentle medium way slope, just like you said, for default, because yeah. that's what it's all about. And most of the scar tissue we deal with, unless it's 20 years old and calcified and infected and really, I think, gnarly with a G, yeah, which makes it medical. Gnarly with an N is like surfing, but gnarly with a G is the medical term. Yeah. Anyway, medium wave soap is just fine. It works. And I don't worry about it. It's No. I and... If you are treating the cause of why that gnarly scar tissue got there in the first place, you don't even need to bring out the heavy artillery to bust it up because you and your big brain have figured out that it didn't come, people weren't born with it. It didn't come from, it doesn't come from outer space. It came from something. So something tore, something bled, something broke, something, something happened up the river, go up the river. Yeah. Exactly. I'm not, saying, I'm not saying you don't have to still bust things up because there still will be things left behind. But when we are treating the cause, you don't need the muscle. I I had so much fun yesterday. This woman came in that is basically healthy 
and she has all this low back pain and neck and shoulder pain. And so the first thing I did it was palpate her abdomen. And she's trigger points in the psoas, trigger points in the QLs, referring into the glutes, like just the classic pattern. And so you just put in scarring in the ureter and watch her face change from to like that. You loosen up the kidney and the kidney fat pad on one side and you go and do it on the other side. And then you do, oh, she had reflux, eosinophilic esophagitis. So at least they gave her the right diagnosis, which was nice. They didn't just call it reflux. And so I treated the esophagus with one machine and treated the supine cervical practicum with another machine. And I did the manual work. And I did all this in 35 minutes because we were running late. And she gets up and she said, oh, and I ran concussion in Vegas because, right? And she gets up and I said, so how's your low back? There's no pain. Uh-huh. Okay. And it's, there's, there, but yeah. So you can say to somebody with a completely straight face, nothing you have scares me. Yeah. And so it was, and then I ran 40 and 10 neck to feet. Yes. It was amplified. So it was, there you go. Leaf has a funny comment here. Okay, gentle, but do you not also vary the amperage? 400 milliamps will usually wake somebody right up. <laughs> yes. Yeah. I don't think I've ever treated anybody at 400, even my very I, large football players. Yeah. Even the large guys, I'll do two or 300. I think I might have tried 400 on my horse. Yes. Yeah. Because, but the towel had to be really wet or he flickered, you know, how like they do when you've got a thing, a fly on them. Yes. Because it, it prickled. And they're and sensitive. Yeah, and 200 is pretty much enough, usually enough. And the only reason I use a higher amperage is to make things happen faster. Right. I don't know why that works. Because back in the day when we first started, we were using 40, 60, 80. And Sonia Pedersen was the one who said, I'm working on an athlete. 100 wasn't getting it. I raised it to 200. And then we got someplace pretty quickly. And it's, oh, okay. okay. So amperage is that way. So I've learned so much. Other people in the field. I just think when I want to increase it, and athletes are always like more and more. I always think of just the first day or the first few minutes of the practicum of the core when we're running a hundred milli or micro or we're, I don't know what is what you start with, but it's, but no, I don't yeah. know what frequency what's on A or what's on B, but you oh, have 40 to and 16. Right. And you're driving that through 25, 30 people. We're yeah. all holding hands. And it so it goes through all of us. And I learned that at our very first symposium in 2003, when Jim Oshman had, like we met in the ballroom at the embassy, this big hotel, big crystal chandelier in the ballroom, 113 FSM practitioners wow. in 2003, the very first symposium. Oshman is lecturing and to experience the power of resonance, he had everybody do ohm at the same time and the room just vibrated and that gave me the idea so we had a blue box and I put it on a chair in the front in the aisle and put 94 and 200 and put one glove on one side and had him hold it and the other glove on the other side and had them hold it. And everybody in the room held hands as we ran 94 and 200 and 970 and 33 as they chanted Om. Wow. And it was indescribable what happened to the room. It's, I think the whole hotel levitated. It was amazing. Oh, that would have been very cool. I'm oh, jealous of that. I wasn't there, I, but you, you what else is on your list? Let's okay. not leave your list. 
Okay, so we have a couple questions. And one of the questions that I was emailed, it was long winded, but I'm going to extrapolate the question part because this person could not understand why we would ever or disagreed that there are certain people that you would not always want to treat the Vegas on. Because we've talked about certain professions that you're not going to use concussion in Vegas. It's better to just leave the Vegas where it is. That person needs another explanation because doesn't understand that even the sniper that has to go into work the next morning should have his Vegas treated. If it, if you're treating him the day before, that's fine. It'll quiet down his nervous system. It'll give him a good night's sleep, get his heart rate down and quiet down the immune system. And when it's time for the vagus to be turned off, the nervous system was going to win. The only other place I don't run it is the patient that came in, I swear to you, with a pulse of 42. That's a good face. It's blood pressure was 105 over 70. Okay. Completely healthy, pink, obviously not in distress. Yeah. I said, does your doctor know your pulse is 42? Yeah. Any problem with that? No, that is the only patient I've ever used quiet the vagus on and we got her pulse up to 67. And then oh. it didn't stay there. Yeah. Because her heart is, you might want to talk to your GP or your cardiologist about that. Yeah. Yeah. We're educators, Maddie. Oh, okay. dear. Okay. Let's read Maddie's question out loud because. Okay. So we will say 65 year old patient who has osteoarthritis in her knees, bilateral knee replacements, pain is nine out of 10 always. She's had ketamine, steroids, you name it, she's had it. I never run metal allergy before. I'm suspicious of it. I usually treat athletes and kids, don't see mature patients. So I'm wondering your thoughts. Knee flexion is locked at 90, bilaterally, hip and low back are clear, full sensation, lower limb reflexes, pain is roughly over tibial plateau on both sides. Surgery was 11 years ago, seeing her as a favor. Okay, you start, but I'm going to chime in. There's a thing, when nine out of 10 always for 11 years, it Good heavens, when they take the leg apart to put in the knee replacement, they stretch both the femoral nerve and the sciatic nerve and all of the all of the nerves. And sometimes they don't recover. So there's that. The first thing I think of because of the, the first case I had like this way back in 2002. It was just a nerve traction injury and it was a patient that I'd become really close to. And I did a house call and she was at a nine. And when I left, she was at a two. So there's that. And if it's just at the tibial plateau, metals allergy in the bone marrow and the bone, that's a thing. Torn and broken in the tendons, so you, the knee flexion is locked. So that means she can't go past 90 or she can't straighten it. I'm guessing she can't go past 90. Yeah, can't go past 90 is pretty, honestly, it's something I've run into with the knee. Yeah, firm. Knee replacements are difficult because there are so many complex curves and 11 years ago, they didn't have the hardware that they have now. So the hip is pretty simple by comparison. Yeah. You have the size of the ball, the angle of the femoral neck to the femur. Those are the variables, yes. size of the ball, size of the socket and the angle of the femoral neck. The knee, you've got complex curves in the femur, complex curves in the tibia. It's just complicated. And 11 years ago, they didn't have the choices right. that they have now. Now they actually can go in and measure the angles because you have 
not just the curve on the femoral side and the tibial plateau, you have the thickness of the condyles, the angles, all of that. So I, torn and broken in the tendon, the nerve is the only thing I can think of that is a nine out of 10. She'll be spinally centralized, so 40 and 10, centrally centralized, 40 and 89. And remind me to go back to that on this post herpetic neuralgia patient that I saw. Okay. And that's, and then metals allergy, and then torn and broken in the tendon. Obviously, everything that you said, but the torn and broken is a bit, the, a big component, I think, that we forget about in these yeah. chronic cases because everything was torn and broken in the surgery. Even before she had the knee replacement, there's just this long standing history. That's what arthritis is, or that's why it develops, is because things are torn and broken as a younger person. It's worn down, it's ground down. I think when you're suspicious of a metal allergy, I think that hopefully that means that you think there might be one that will take the pain down right away. Like it's a very good diagnostic tool running nine, like you said, and and, 16, because Maddie asked about what's the frequency it's 16 for metal and then nine for histamine. Yeah. I found that nine is very helpful for getting pain down when you are thinking in, like I was very skeptical about all that, especially when I told you the famous case when I had a woman who had all this back pain that developed three years after having her gallbladder out and she had those clips. And I knew she had her gallbladder out and I was already thinking, okay, there's probably a lot of scar tissue in her abdomen, which is leading to faulty biomechanics in her back. And I had run all the scarring and I had run torn and broken and I had run everything I could except for the metal allergy frequencies. And it was only nine that took the pain down. So this was the sixth, fifth or sixth time that I saw her. She was one of those great patients to work with because she'd be like, ooh, whatever you're running, that feels great. Or I don't feel a change. And it was instant. The minute I put it on nine, she's like, oh, this feels fantastic. I'm like slop, slopped over the, I'm like, yes, yes, it does. It does feel <laughs> fantastic. What was, what just happened? Where were we? Um, but, and then that led me to call you and text you and run the whole gamut. And, and then the follow-up, like I said, there's nothing more, if you get the pain down, this is nothing more than a party trick. So then is the discussion of, okay, you're going to need to buy a custom care because the metal in your knees is not going anywhere. Right. The that I treated with her gallbladder clips that she was reacting to, we figured out that we could get her pain, totally pain-free for about eight or nine days. And then it would start creeping back. And so at that point, she was like, I'm just going to buy a custom care. And it's been at least eight or nine years. And she's still doing well. Yeah. So there. True story. It's it's true story. story. Yeah. Uh, tourniquet. I've seen a significant increase in limitations of range of motion due to the trauma of lymphatics and all things due to the tourniquet time pressure since they respond so very well to those specific frequencies. 63, oh, lymph nodes, something I've learned at the sports advanced. That's a thought. Yeah, it, that's the other thing is the nerves are damaged by the, the tourniquet is applied up in the upper thigh and it cuts off the blood supply to a lot of tissues. 11 years is a long time though. That's just a spooky. Yeah. Oh, can I do a quick one on yeah. the yeah. Yeah. neuralgia lady? Yes. She's, had, she's 96. She came up from, that's a good face, sharp as attack, came up from Southern California. She has post herpetic neuralgia at T12 yeah. and was really jumpy and scared and apprehensive anytime I even approached the area. So it started out about maybe four or five centimeters in length along the spine and then went out about 12 centimeters. And then there was a little patch in the very front at the end of the T12 nerve root in her lower abdomen. And so I started out with quieting the spinal cord sensitization and like a whole two and a half hours and 40 and 89 uh -huh. 
for the first day. And then the second day was two hours on 40 and 10 and 40 and 89, besides treating the nerve, yeah. treating the scarring and the nerve, doing all the things you do. Yeah. And the third treatment, it's like now I'm running 40 and 89. And it's, you know how I hate to do reruns, right? If you have to do the same thing over and over again, you're missing something. So we did scarring in the dura. And we've done that. And then there's this frequency nerve sheath, which I'm never sure is useful. I've never been a big believer in 475. So I did 40 and the nerve sheath and 81 and 396 increased secretions in the nerve. Because the problem in post-traumatic neuralgia is that the nerve has been so damaged that it can't do nerve things like conductivity yeah exquisitely painful so i'm watching her and when i get my hand on the area and i start taking apart the scar tissue in the nerve the dura the nerve sheath she's jumping and she's just so apprehensive tuesday I started with 40 and 89, and then I watched her face. It would jump, and it was almost like quieting the thalamus was getting in her way. Her brain had switched from pain amplification to the normal function of the thalamus to pain suppression. So I turned off 40 and 89 and it would spike when I hit the scar tissue, pulled on the nerve, it would spike. And then she'd take it back down herself. Wow. The yeah. There was a thing where I'm just watching her face and thinking she's not centralized anymore. She can do this on her own. So cool. It was so cool. And then yesterday, I ran, swear to you, reduce inflammation in the nerve sheath and increase secretions in the nerve. Yeah. And then a sec third machine from her neck to the nerve running increased secretions in the sensory cortex. Because if you can get it reconnected to the brain, yeah. be, I had my hand on it. I was scrubbing on it. I was trying to find something that was still stuck absolutely nothing wow get the machine off of her she can now bend forward at the waist tie her shoes no problem she gets out into the waiting room sits down leans her back up against the chair and it's hot again it's sensitive again wow and it, she was saying this is like not I don't understand this. And so that makes two of us. I don't get it. You can't walk around with a microcurrent on you know, all the time. Right. So we'll change what we do. And because I treat her in the rocking chair, yeah, the recliner. Yeah. So now I'm going to treat her when she's sitting up in a chair. Yeah. See if we can aggravate it and get it to last because she's leaving for Southern California tomorrow. That's a good face. And I was thinking maybe the arachnoid. And the Pia, because I treated the Dura. Yeah. And that seemed to help. But I don't, I haven't, I just, I don't get it. I've been playing with the nerve sheet. And I, when I was telling you about it, you're like, no, it doesn't work. And I'm like, yeah, but I keep going back to it. I just think I'm not smart enough to figure out how to use it yet. Because I believe, I'll say it live, you can die. Now it's, I'm re being recorded. I believe in it. I just don't know how to use it yet. But there is well, figured out how to use it. This was the first time. So I did scarring in the nerve sheath. Yes. Friday or Monday. And then Tuesday, I did reduce inflammation in the nerve sheath. Because what if the nerve sheath is actually the glial cells, that lining? Because the nerve sheath is just the glial. There's, yeah. There is no such tissue as a nerve sheath. Yeah. There's the glial cells. Yeah. 
This is the point at which in the seminar, I usually say, yeah, it's not like we know what we're doing. Yeah, I say that now in the sports course when I have 46 up there, as the slide actually says sarco something, because it could be the sarcomere, the sarcolemma, or the sarcoplasm. And I've used it in all three cases with results. Yeah. Depending on what my intent is. Yeah. And the first time I treated thenar and hypothenar atrophy, yeah. it worked when you did 81 and 396. But in order to get the muscle, get it to hold, you had to run 81 and 46. You could actually increase this grip strength. It wouldn't hold, yeah. but to have the muscle go from neuropathic atrophy to normal yeah. in we're talking 20 minutes. That's not possible. No. 46 is sarco something. It's sarco something. And if you think about it as a sarcomere, then that makes sense because you are increasing the sliding filament mechanism of the muscle fibers, which is causing contraction. But when I was using it to decrease girth in somebody post-exercise, so their legs are full of lactate, all the byproducts, the sarco plasm, the fluid around the myofibrils is increased after hypertrophy and you run 40 and it starts going down in size. Now, if it's the sarcomere, that doesn't make any sense because the sliding filament mechanism isn't in play here. It's at rest. So it must be fluid that's decreased. So talk about having your brain explode. Like I, and then I say, yeah, I don't know what it is. It's the sarco something. Yeah. No, and I'm sticking to that. Yeah, fair enough. It's it's that's why FSM is clinical research, is what we're engaged in. Yes. That. Let's get to a couple more questions before I ask you a couple okay. more questions here. Okay. okay. So, yeah. Treating cysts, ovaries, uterus, kidney. Oh, where are we? I'm going to go way up on the question and answer Maria's question okay. at the top. Okay. Cysts in the ovaries. Yes. I'm not sure what a cyst in the uterus is. Ovarian cysts are like easy. It's just yeah. 40 and seven. Yeah. And sometimes 284 if they're old and gunky and then scarring in the ovary. Shrinking an ovarian cyst is like so much fun. They go from grapefruit size or tangerine size down to goldfish in 30, 45 minutes. So that's pretty cool. And then in, in the uterus, the other thing with the uterus is it's fibroids and I can stop, we can stop them from bleeding. I'm not, we haven't had a hundred percent success yeah. with uterine fibroids. It's, you can get them to stop bleeding. You can reduce them in size. But if they're really big, it's just can't get it done. Kidney cysts, that is outside our scope. So that, I don't know where that went. Did you I, I just that? Hit it. Yeah. <laughs> Kevin. I'm it up here. Leaf says, have you tried heart math to help keep the vagus turned on? What's No, not really. And there are times when, how would I put this? Use heart math at night, but assuming the patient is not centrally sensitized, right? Yeah. Childhood trauma, blah, blah, blah. Uh, the body is so complicated. The vagus is so everywhere Yeah. that at some point you really have to respect the fact that the vagus and the central nervous system and the neuroendocrine immune system have a wisdom about when the vagus should be on reduced. It's never completely off. It's the same thing with turning down inflammation. Yeah. I turn the vagus on. If my body needs the inflammation for some reason, the, it'll, the neuroendocrine immune system will turn the vagus back within an hour or two anyway. It's such a complex, interrelated, interwoven system that it is a good idea 
not to be so arrogant that you think you can mess with it with impunity. So pharmaceuticals have the same problem, right? There are different receptors, different genes, different pathways. And it, it's the same thing with FSM. Why would you treat SIBO without treating the vagus? Duh. Is right. esophagitis. She's already on a food allergy diet. She's already eliminated the allergens. Then all I have to do is treat the gut, turn on the vagus and treat the esophagus. It shouldn't be that hard, right? It's just eosinophilic esophagitis. Right. There you go. All right. Muscular tissues and hot flashes. Yeah. I think stem from Epstein. Okay. If you have a room full of 100 people, 98% 98 of them will test positive for Epstein-Barr infection years ago. It's ubiquitous. It's everywhere. So if they have muscular issues and hot flashes, I would look someplace else besides Epstein-Barr. It's if you have 100 people in a room, none of whom have any nerve pain or any back pain, and you did an MRI of all 100, 80 of them will have disc bulges in the lumbar spine and have absolutely no symptoms. So it's no, it, and if she has a positive X, Epstein-Barr titer, then you just, depends on her age, hot flashes, try estrogen replacement if she's 58. And if you have a different opinion, go ahead, because that's just my hit on it. I got nothing. Okay. Cool. A couple more here. Debbie says, client with calcification T67, been told that the calcification is removed. She will be paralyzed. She doesn't want me um, to do anything with her spine. She has shoulder issues. Would she become paralyzed if I did 40 and 10? No. No. Who? Okay. I, That's just a scary thing to tell somebody. It is. What were they thinking? And 40 and 10 is not treating calcifications in the spine. Right. It is. It, no. I, okay. But number one, what is calcifying? So if it's a disc that's bulging and touching the thecal sac and there's cord compression, Debbie, if you're going to run 40 and 10, do it alternating, right? Neck to feet, depending on what's going on at T6, 7. Yeah. Shoulder issues is going to be C5, 6. So that doesn't have anything to do with the thoracic spine. But if she has cord stenosis or cord compression at 6, 7, just run everything that you're going to run neck to feet and 40 and 10 isn't going to hurt her. And the supine cervical practicum done neck to shoulder is probably going to do her the most good there. Bryce came to the sports and the core, and then he came to the sports advance. He just couldn't get enough learning. I know he was so much fun. So much fun. So he wants us to know that you'll be pleased to know that in my first CRPS case since returning, a case of cold and dry. Thank repurposed you. our pizza oven thermometer to take temperatures of her foot. I love innovativeness and watched as it slowly warmed. So fun. Question I have is about when at the end I ran 40 and 89. There was a part I really didn't know how long to wait for that. So I ended up guessing turned off after about seven minutes. But do you have any other indications that would tell you when you are done with 40 and 89 at the end? That's a great question, Bryce. And good job. With well all the pain, especially using the pizza thermometer, you're like a little yeah. fever. We use the COVID thermometer, the one you, the point and shoot that you buy at the hardware store. Yeah. And at 40 and 89 at the end, I decide on how long to use that by the look on the patient's face. Uh -huh. You assume to a certain extent that they're centrally sensitized. And when their foot is out of pain, they get this confused look on their face. Yes. And you run 40 and 89 until that look on their face goes away. And then you do 
40 and 92 to tell the sensory cortex to forget everything it knows about the foot. And more important, you only run that for a minute or two, but more important than you run increased secretions in the sensory and motor cortex from the neck. And I'm putting my finger in my ear because it's really the only time that I ever run current through the brain. It's like right foot, and then you have the towel around the neck and you just creep the towel up to the ear. And as soon as you run 81 and 92, bam, motor function returns to the CRPS patient. But that's, it's just, it's so much fun. Yay. Yay. Well okay. done, Bryce. Well done. And well done us for getting through all the questions because I have, so the list always just takes its own little turn, but there are a couple of things I wanted to ask you because it is International Women's Day. We need to highlight some of the amazingness that you are as our international woman of amazingness. So I had all these questions and I was listening to podcasts today and I was reading this one, one of these women CEOs talking about how they've forage through these very like male domineering industries to become like women bosses and stuff. And I was thinking about you and your journey throughout all of this. And it's not like you had an example or a mentor. Like not a female. Wrong. I not a female. I watched Jeff Bland. I started hanging out with Jeff Bland in 1995 and I watched what he did with functional medicine, how he did it. Right. How inclusive he was, how intellectually curious he was, how that how he built that network through research and inviting experts in the field to contribute. And so he was my mentor. And I came from the era when women's lib first started in the 70s. So I got my first job as a pharmaceutical rep in 1971. And lucky for me, I was about a size seven and it was the era of, era of mini skirts. And so you could have a jacket and a short skirt. And the doctors that I called on as a drug rep would say, you're not one of those women lovers, are you? Said, of course not. And then you are one, but as long as you didn't take that label. and what I found over the years was that the equality movement has been very helpful. It's been like surfing that wave, right? And the biggest challenge I had was being a chiropractor in a world of MDs. But then when you go to a medical meeting and you have name tags that don't have your degree on them, and I start talking to an MD who doesn't know I'm a chiropractor, but we speak the same language. And I start talking about cytokines and neuroendocrine immune integration, blah, blah, blah. It was, there's that. And you, I don't know. I guess my mentor was probably my mom in some ways. She came in from the Dust Bowl to Salinas and never finished high school, but took a correspondence course to be a bookkeeper and did that, did not have an easy life. And she's the one that I have my 12 rules. She's the one that created the rule. Everybody does the best they can at the time with what they've got. If I they could that. do any better, they would. So it's... Uh, yeah, I don't know. I don't even think it's this is the other thing. One of the other things I learned watching Jeff was one of the reasons that Jeff is successful is he doesn't have a huge ego around it. At least if he does, he keeps it in a shoebox in the closet. I don't think of myself as extraordinary. I'm intellectually curious. I do synthesis is my superpower. And what's more amazing, much more amazing than me, is what the frequencies do and what, and the fact that they're teachable 
And it's much more important what you can do with them and what Bryce can do with them and what Debbie and Lee, what everybody else can do with them. That's agreed. You know, yeah. Well, so, I have a, I have a quote today. Sorry. Yay. It's International Women's Day. I had to go with it. There is no force equal to a woman determined to rise. Amen. Not to have a slight on the men that are listening and a part of our community, but it's just for today, I wanted to highlight all the women practitioners. And for me, I have a soft spot for the women practitioners in sports because it has been very tough for us to get into locker rooms and to be taken seriously and not to be seen or objectified. So my hats go off to all the women in sports therapy out there that are forging the way. And that concludes yet another vast podcast. I I don't know how this hour evaporates so quickly. We all start talking. We share and, the stories and yes, our community is fantastic. Yeah, it's true. There's the International Women's Day, and there's yin and yang. Yeah. Yep. So every woman has the female version of male energy and the female version of female energy. Every male has, well, non binary people, right? Yeah, but the male has a feminine side and a masculine side that make the same yin and yang. So International Women's Day, it's wonderful that we have a day to acknowledge women. But at the same time, for the guys that are listening, it is equally important, I think, to acknowledge and celebrate the feminine side of male energy, right? Yes. That is, and I'm not even sure that I know what that is or want to say what that is, but it's, there you go. Let's just be grateful for all the people doing all the things. Amen. I love it. Yeah. All right. Have a fabulous rest of your week. We will see you next Wednesday. See you next Wednesday. Thanks everybody. Bye. Bye. The Frequency Specific Microcurrent Podcast has been produced by Frequency Specific Seminars for entertainment, educational, and information purposes only. The information and opinion provided in the podcast are not medical advice, do not create any type of doctor-patient relationship, and unless expressly stated, do not reflect the opinions of its affiliates, subsidiaries, or sponsors, or the hosts, or any of the podcast guests or affiliated professional organizations. No person should act or refrain from acting on the basis of the content provided in any podcast without first seeking appropriate medical advice and counseling. No information provided in any podcast should be used as a substitute for personalized medical advice and counseling. FSS expressly disclaims any and all liability relating to any actions taken or not taken based on or any contents of this podcast.